We want the U.S. to finally recognize the sovereignty of countries in Latin America, the reality that Latin America has changed, and that it is time for a policy that is one based on mutual respect. And yet, on the other hand, you have the U.S. trying to continue to impose its will on Latin America and the Caribbean, whether it's through a continued military presence, through brutal economic sanctions that are imposed on Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, uh, or through the uh, U.S. companies that try to continue to exploit the, uh, the mines, the logging, uh, the lithium, the uh, resources, the oil. And so you have a real disconnect. And we are saying that it's time that U.S. policy recognizes that this is not the U.S. backyard. Coincidentally, in 1823, the year that the Monroe Doctrine was enunciated, um, you also had a Supreme Court decision uh, through the Marshall Court uh, that decided that through uh, you know this process of cherry Creek removal, you have the influx of white settlers into the state of Georgia. You have uh, Chief Justice John Marshall declaring that the United States had inherited the doctrine of discovery or the discovery principle from previous colonizing powers. And in this case, he traces it back to the Holy See or the Catholic Church. Um, but this sort of process of uh, colonization and what could only be described as ideologies of brutality really originates mostly from the founding fathers themselves. They use these, you know, this doctrine of the doctrine of discovery as sort of a made-up excuse to colonize indigenous peoples. And, you know, it's important to, to point out that in 1823, the United States was a relatively small nation compared to its present-day form. So. In 1823, the Monroe Doctrine is aligning itself with the doctrine of discovery as sort of this imperialist, expansionist ideology um, that we can see, you know, the effects of today. It's precisely the implementation of the Monroe Doctrine and the creation of what essentially became uh, the birthplace of the American empire in Latin America uh, that uh, resulted in so many people from the, uh, Latin America coming to the United States in the, uh, in the, especially in the late 20th century and the beginning of this century. And a lot of people don't understand that relationship. In fact, it's precisely those countries in Latin America that the United States uh, once uh, intervened in, occupied, uh, and uh, executed regime changes in that have produced the most migrants. Uh, to the United States. Uh, so there's a direct relationship uh, between the empire the U United States built in Latin America and the migration crisis uh, that we continue to uh, face here in this country. And, you know, and I don't think that most Americans really understand the, the, uh, the enormous number of interventions uh, that our governments have, uh, have perpetrated in Latin America. I mean, you can think of um, 1965, when Lyndon Johnson sent in uh, several thousand U.S. troops to occupy the Dominican Republic. At that time, Johnson specifically said that the United States has no intention of allowing another communist government uh, to exist uh, in, the, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and you could go into uh, Panama in, in 1989, uh, Guatemala in 1954, the Dominican Republic even earlier in, uh, in, the, the, in 1916, uh, uh, Mexico, Honduras, Nicaragua, all of these countries were invaded by U.S. military forces based on the established right, as far as Washington understood, that it could determine uh, what was happening throughout all of its, quote, backyard or its, or its empire. And I think that that's, that's what's at stake uh, that needs to be finally renounced, especially given the enormous changes in Latin America, that Latin America is no longer subservient to the United States in the way—or its governments are no longer subservient to the United States in the way that they have been in the past.